Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we will be talking about a um, global pandemic, rising, tr rising fraud, risk prevention and protection. Today's webinar will be um, joined by two, um, two panellists, um, Gavin Can Cunningham from uh, Menzies from HLB UK and Pedro Aravello from Plenitude Consulting. If you have any questions, please use the chat box um, in the right-hand corner to ask the panellists. And they will be discussing uh, three main points in, in today's webinar. Um, financial crime, what are the emerging trends and threats? How to manage these threats? And then the steps to take when things go wrong. And to start us on the financial crime, um, I'm going to hand over to Gavin to introduce the topic to us. Uh, good afternoon or morning, wherever we are in the world. Uh, to start with, um, I've set up there the uh, often used quote from Warren Buffett, the renowned US investor. When he used this quote, and he's used it several times over the decades, he was really talking about how when times get hard, you can see who really knows how to invest well. Um, it's easy enough to invest in good times, but when the tide goes out, then you can see who's been swimming naked. It can, of course, also uh, refer to uh, fraud um, and the incidence of fraud in the recession. And it's when people uh, get found out. Um, so you often find in a recession that the lack of economic activity exposes um, the lack of underlying substance to many investments um, or businesses and the assets perhaps don't really exist. Um, perhaps there's been a Ponzi-style pyramid investment scheme and when the going gets tough, people want to ask for their money back. And of course, the money dries up very quickly without new investment being put in, in the bottom. Um, famously, Bernie Madoff and Madoff's um, Ponzi scheme was found out in 2008 uh, in the last uh, great crash when evidence began to surface that um, there was nothing underpinning it. Ian, it had actually been running for many decades and cost something around $20 billion. And in these circumstances, it's an opportunity for fraud. And fraud can occur because people are short of cash and attempted towards fraud and activity, or because the recession or the recessionary impact itself um, gives an opportunity for fraudsters to come up with new schemes and make more money. Um, perhaps because Genuine schemes then offer a lower rate of return and frauds as offer investment opportunities with higher rates of return. Uh, people get tempted, for example. Um, this, though, is a, a most unusual recession. It's not really coming out about because of the classic economic factors. It's uh, come about because of the global medical emergency, which has prompted government action around the world that has caused impact on all our economies by lockdown, et cetera. And in response, I think most companies around the world, sorry, most countries around the world have pumped, pumped billions into their economy. And simply the availability of finance is a great opportunity for fraudsters. To use um, Buffett's own metaphor, it's as if faced with a fast retreating tide, governments around the world have lost a dam to flood the beach and cover it up. But uh, as the water from that recedes, or no more dams are left to burst, then the effect of being exposed on the beach will return. And I think fraud will go through the roof. Um, in summary, and in short, I think the law enforcement authorities and governments all over the world are very worried about what is going to come next. Moving on. So what I want to do is outline a few high risk uh, areas um, and also provide a few examples of known criminal activity and trends um, across the globe. Uh, sitting here talking to you from London, it's inevitable that I'm more aware of what's going on in my own local domain, but in looking up the trends for this talk today, it's self evident that there are very similar uh, fraud events happening all over the world and that fraudsters are. Uh, taking every opportunity that's given to them. Um, just to deal very, very briefly, the, the graphic you can see there of the 
uh, globe um, is based on a survey um, done by a Berlin-based consulting firm of 58 countries, which shows uh, quite clearly the incidence of PPE and medical, medical equipment-related fraud uh, that they, they found. Um, the picture on the right is from uh, Interpol and relates to the fact that in a fraud, fraudsters have no qualms about exploiting an opportunity and coming up with fake vaccines um, in the current situation, fake medical equipment. They prey on opportunity and opportunity often arises from the confusion caused by chaos and the medical emergency of the last 12 months or so has created more opportunity than perhaps any other single global event uh, since the end of the Second World War. Professional criminals want to get your money um, and they won't give it back. They don't care about the individual circumstances of firms and people or the damage that will caused to a business. It's their job, it's their job to try and get the money from you fraudulently and they can be very good at it. Of course, technological advances um, have provided new ways to deliver a fraud and it can be quite sophisticated now. But in, in essence, they're just running old frauds using a technical base, using the internet basically. Um, victims fall out, fall foul, I think, out of their own necessity or perhaps they're tempted by high reward. And you can take steps to protect yourself, as I know Pedro uh, explained when he gets to his talk. Um, there are worldwide alerts issued by Interpol across all the key sources of the world to do with the sort of activity as a consequence of the pandemic. I just wanted to look at um, a few actual examples just to give some flavour of what has been going on. Um, they're slightly chosen at random, they've come from public source information from Interpol and the Financial uh, Action Task Force, uh, which is a global organisation. And what you find looking around the world is very similar patterns. So these, starting with Brazil, are fairly typical of what you could find in most countries around the world at the moment, I think. The, um, as it said, the federal police um, in Brazil um, have been concentrating on honing in on public contract fraud, and they found about 360 million US dollars worth of fraud in the last um, nine months of last year, eight months of last year. This has related largely to the misapplication of public resources by um, false procurement, by bribery to enter into contracts by providing goods which are substandard, having bribed public officials to buy the goods. Sometimes the goods just don't exist. Um, overpricing, as it says, at the bottom. So in the states of Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, as early as May last year, remembering the pandemic only really kicked off in uh, February, March, um, the police in those states have started Operation Placebo and that was linked to around about 160 million US dollars worth of fraudulent activity in the place of contract. Um, four or five months later, in the state of Para, the so called Operation SOS uh, was, even, was nearly the same size again, it was about 95 million US dollars worth of um, false contracts. And with these contracts, with this kind of activity, it won't be one off, it won't be individual people who are opportunists prey um, on government contracts. This will be far more organised and perhaps linked to organised crime gangs beneath. And those organised crime gangs may be based in Brazil, but these days they could be based anywhere in the world. So here's a, a European example, which again, I think is probably pretty typical of um, what's occurred. The um, contract originally started in Germany. Um, the authorities in Germany, right at the start of the pandemic, really March 2020, um, they were, as many countries were, desperate to find uh, protective equipment. And they used two companies, one in Zurich, one in Hamburg, to try and source what turned out to be a 15 million euro contract for face masks and other medical equipment. Um, they went to new sources because the global shortage of all of that kind of equipment made it very difficult to use 
uh, the normal procurement channels. And so they looked for new vendors, new suppliers, and that took them to an email address and a website, which looked real um, and was in Spain. <coughs> Sorry. But the site was fake, uh, and the email addresses on it were, were also connected to the same fake site that were compromised. Um, the company, which uh, wasn't a real company, claimed to have 10 million of these 15 uh, or so million face masks they wanted. Uh, the delivery fell through at the last minute, and then it referred the bar to, probably by then increasingly desperate, to a dealer in Ireland to put in touch with another supplier in the Netherlands. Um, and then an agreement for an initial delivery of 1.5 million masks was made for an upfront payment of 1.5 million euros, so a euro per mask. And just before the due delivery date, uh, the buyers were informed that another sudden payment was required in order to get the knife released and delivered, and that was 880,000 euros. Um, the buyers then realized that they were potentially being scammed. They'd already sent the 1.5 million euros. Um, they told their bank, their bank told Interpol. Um, Interpol was able to get onto it very quickly and identify the Irish company involved. The, Picture on the right hand side of the screen is the uh, actual picture of the Irish uh, police um, where, they, where they tied in how the um, invoice payment system worked. Um, the Dutch authorities traced the, uh, the additional 880,000 euros which have also been sent and uh, they managed to free them. In, at the end, um, the funds were recovered, which is highly unusual and really shouldn't be expected. Um, and two people were arrested in the Netherlands. But interestingly, perhaps of the money that uh, was sent, 500,000 uh, euros was going to Nigeria. And in my nearly 30 years of uh, fraud investigation experience, Nigeria is a common theme behind sophisticated, well organized frauds and is often to be found on, on the money trail. Um, there's no real surprise to me that it's there. Uh, moving on again. So, financial crime, cyber crime. Cyber crime is a very um, frequently used buzzword uh, at the moment. There is no doubt whatsoever that uh, the lockdown has increased the volume and incidence of crime related to internet usage. Um, cyber crime can have a far more technical uh, meaning or connotation to it. Um, perhaps at its most sophisticated involving hacking and so on. This isn't really what we're talking about here. Um, Cybercrime and the availability of global contact through the, uh, through the internet means now that you can set up a fraud and run it across the entire world. And it, the proliferation of fraud opportunity and fraud incidents, I think, follows largely um, from that. And the, the frauds, just to give you some idea, um, there's been various surveys done in the last 12 months or so, and the, the incidence of um, email and um, false domain attacks has gone up exponentially. Uh, I've seen figures 250, 300 times higher than it was previously, and I think it's probably still rising. And I don't know if you suffer from um, phone calls at home and spam emails, but the incidence of those, I can assure you, on a personal level, has also increased commensurately. So there is a lot more opportunity. It's a lot easier to run for us when you're doing it through an internet platform. Um, for example, if there were over 60,000 COVID-19 registered false domains set up since January 2020, and that was uh, just in the first eight months of last year. And um, that will again have carried on increasing, so it will be even more now. Um, they target largely the retail industry, we're all at home buying things online, um, and false websites don't really exist. Selling non-existent goods is, is uh, probably the most common aspect of this. Um, phishing, which uh, you may, may not be familiar with, um, is really simply when um, people at criminals use email to um, enable the attack and set up the fraud. Uh, it may download malware, it may direct people to a dodgy website, 
um, it may even open up the possibility of um, ransomware attacks where you download um, malicious software and you can only remove it by paying a ransom to the criminals who provided it to you. Um, it, it can come from any internet-based source. Uh, just a couple of examples noted on the screen there. Uh, the first in Spain was something that uh, spoofed or imitated um, an actual real retailer um, and set up a, a false website which looked for all the world like the real one. Uh, its purpose was actually to obtain ID information of victims and their bank and credit card details, which of course had their own worth. And in the criminal world or the criminal underworld, obtaining lists of bank and credit card numbers has its own value and they are freely traded on the dark web and have, I, I can't tell you what the going rate is, that you can buy people's um, personal banking and credit card details. And then other criminal organizations will use them and misuse them. Um, in the second case in uh, Singapore, there was a fake order for face mask and hand gel. Um, people with French pharmaceutical company thought it was actually dealing with a real new supplier again in that initial uh, rush of the pandemic when there wasn't enough medical equipment to bounce. Um, the money went off to Singapore. The French company again was able to spot it happening and the Singaporean police in my experience are very efficient, uh, were able to link it through a Singapore bank account to a Singapore national and uh, someone was actually arrested. Uh, and I think most of the money in that case has been frozen and recovered. Perhaps when we think of uh, fraud, the largest fraud have been investment related. Um, Madoff, as I said earlier, being the largest single fraud case, I think, uh, of all time. Um, a lot of the investment fraud activity has been linked into COVID by the pretense of developing miracle cures, vaccines, uh, new forms of medical equipment. and People have been tempted to invest in those companies because, of course, they've seen firsthand um, and they have firsthand experience of the effects of COVID and the need for vaccines um, and other medical developments. Um, it's no different to any other form of scam, really, um, other than, again, you're now able to advertise on the internet globally. Um, historically, in my experience of working within law enforcement, uh, 30, 25 years ago, people had to place adverts in newspapers like the International Herald Tribune, which was uh, circulated around the world, and offer loans and investment schemes. Um, and it's labor intensive. Um, now, you simply post something on the internet, it gets picked up, and people are tempted, and then you send them a glossy internet uh, brochure and promise return, and people are tricked in, into uh, investing in these kind of schemes. Um, in these couple of examples I've, I've put up there, the, the first one in California in June um, is someone doing precisely that, um, saying that he developed through uh, a company a miracle cure. Um, it was actually marketing pills that um, would cure COVID, and he had people uh, right back and eventually invest with him um, in order to give it some credibility, although not improve the credibility to me. Um, he also represented that he had people interested in buying his company and actually uh, said that they, you know there were people in the Middle East and Dubai who were going to buy two companies for 10 billion US dollars. Um, it gives the appearance of a very successful business. Um, in fact, he was. Uh, just one person in California, um, and I think he netted four or five million US dollars. Um, in the, the second example is a little bit more sophisticated, and Interpol issued what they call purple notice, which is a warning notice to all the police forces affiliated to Interpol for all the countries, I think it was 194 or five, um, in January this year, outlining a very specific new form of fraud that they found, 
which relates to dating apps. So with dating apps, one of the cons for us over the last five, ten years has been that the person doesn't exist and they ask that you enter into an online relationship with them and at some point they ask you for money. In this case, that isn't how it worked. You entered into an online um, arrangement with the person who would never meet and at some point they would start talking to you about how they were making all this money through this investment opportunity that they uh, found and they'd lure you through the dating app into what is actually just an investment fraud scheme. Um, you'd have to download the app and run it and they'd promise that you were doing very well and it actually give you some kind of return as you're going along and you'd reach a goal or the IP level and you'd get more return and you'd, you'd have to invest in it but by that time you were pretty sure it was real and then when you maximise your investment one day you'd log on and find you were closed out and all the money had gone and you couldn't access it and once you point you probably didn't even know where it was or who had it and I think that's a, a fraud that is still ongoing and as yet no one has been arrested in respect of it. Um, moving on now to sort of government level national um, fraud problem, which is the abuse of the economic stimulus measures which most countries around the world have now brought in. Um, I think it must be the biggest current global fraud problem and also threat with what may follow from it um, since we don't know how it will unwind yet. So just dealing with um, some examples, the, the US has a number of um, stimulus schemes, the Paycheck Protection Plan, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Scheme and then Unemployment Insurance um, and they throw money to businesses and individuals in order to make sure they have money to live on or their businesses can survive and employees don't have to be sacked. Um, in this particular case of shown there, which was in Washington State um, in July last year, the person actually obtained five and a half million US dollars in loans. Um, he was a tech executive um, who set up new companies with no background to them and then he made numerous uh, false declarations as to their operations and the number of employees under the US uh, Paycheck Protection Program. <laughs> he was then entitled to obtain money for those employees. Um, he also faked the tax filings um, as well. So he was there saying that one company had dozens of employees and paid millions of dollars in wages, but it was um, only a month old, had never traded, and actually had no employees. And one of the problems governments have faced with these very widespread um, economic support schemes is that they have, don't have time and personnel to check out applicants when, when they apply. That would have been true in that case. Um, perhaps slightly more sinister, in Italy in July 2020, um, a company was uh, set up supposedly trading uh, metals or broken metals. Um, it was linked to an Italian organised crime gang, um, which may not come as too much of a surprise. Um, it produced it false and misleading uh, trading data in order to get tax reliefs and VAT refunds. And when that VAT refund was obtained, it was then sent around several other countries. So it was actually money laundered outside of Italy and then sent back eventually to the people who set up the, the fraud in the first place. And um, the Italian authorities have seized seven and a half million euros worth of assets as a consequence of that. So it's a very typical COVID grant support fraud. But it's somewhat more sophisticated because of the international dimension to it and also the nature of the people behind it. Um, to give you some idea of just one example there in South Florida, they actually charged 38 COVID uh, fraud cases within the whole of 2020, worth over 75 million just in the southern district of Florida alone. Um, moving on now to the situation here in the UK. Um, we have thrown, I think it's upwards, it might be about 200 billion 
and now uh, actual financial support into our economy to try and protect jobs, businesses, as, as other countries have done. Um, if we had thrown in that to a degree, and I believe America is well over a trillion dollars, um, the level of fraud here is they estimate in this country running about 5% of the money that has been provided. And there are two very distinct forms of support. One is government grants, which are not repayable, and the other is uh, business loan schemes through the main banks in the UK, um, which are supposed to be repaid. Um, the first um, type of loans given the furlough scheme fraud, um, furlough scheme against which people are defrauded but their employers largely don't exist. Um, they are actually estimating themselves. HMRC in this country, the uh, Revenue and Customs Service, estimate that the fraud there may be two to four billion pounds that they don't know. And they may never know because they won't have the resource to investigate each and every fraud. Um, and again, some of these are very organized with people setting up false companies online, with false directors, with false employees, and submitted multiple claims, which were processed and paid out almost automatically. The business loan scheme was money uh, provided by banks, supported by government guarantees. And again, the, the current estimate is around 5%, 3.4 billion pounds of fraud losses. Only when people have to start repaying those loans will the question of whether they were real people, real businesses really be known. And in this country, the banks were loath to lend this money to begin with. In fact, they weren't lending it because they couldn't verify the identity of many of the borrowers. So the government intervened and took away the obstacles and guaranteed the loans. And as the quote on the screen says, um, to simplify the application process, the government relaxed consumer protection provisions and actually got rid of the know your customer and anti fraud checks such that people applied and got the money the next day. Um, the impact of this is, I think, potentially catastrophic. The money won't be recovered. Um, we are going to possibly pay that money through taxes over the next 20 or 30 years. And forces, organized criminals, they don't just take the profit and run, they reinvest it. They reinvest it in other fraud schemes, they gear up their fraud capacity, and they um, will be better equipped to run bigger and better fraud in the future. And with all that in mind, I want to hand over now to Pedro, who's going to consider how to avoid fraud or be a victim of fraud in the first place. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and uh, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Pedro Revalo. Um, I believe due to some technical issues, uh, you're not able to see me. You're not missing that much, I must say, and it's just a better calmed version of myself. Um, but uh, but I'm sure that we will nonetheless have a, an interesting chapter here. I've had a few um, points to, to share with you this afternoon. Um, so I wanted to start with um, just just a little bit about uh, about me. What is it that that we do? And I always remember uh, my five year old son asking some time ago, "Daddy, what do you do at work?" And you probably would have a, had a similar question, I suppose, from your children or you know from someone or a, a situation that requires a simple, quick answer. And I told my son, "I help to catch bad people." Right? Um, I'm a senior executive at uh, Plenitude Consulting. We are a London-based um, specialist consulting firm in the financial compliance, um, financial crime compliance space. And basically, we have helped several of the largest organizations in the world to improve their financial crime controls. So from the largest banks, insurance firms uh, who are amongst our clients, uh, often very respectable organizations. And uh, of course, while well, we have the pleasure to have um, HLB International as one of our esteemed uh, clients in the professional services space. Um, we have taken part as well in helping to fix uh, the failures that led to some of the largest uh, money laundering scandals that you probably have heard, have read about, uh, have read about, or have, have heard about uh, in the front pages of the newspapers. 
And uh, well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today as a guest uh, speaker. So thanks uh, to HLB uh, for the kind invitation. Um, I, I must say that this is a bittersweet profession. Uh, I feel in a way pride in making the world, uh, <laughs> as I like to think, uh, a better place for my children, for society, for doing the right thing. As I, I'm sure all of us uh, uh, would agree. But I can see as well how this is a daunting task with financial crime increasingly growing. And, and after hearing uh, Gavin's uh, you know, collection of financial crime trends, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that probably you, you would have uh, walked away with, uh, with a similar impression that actually uh, it's, a, it's a very productive and creative industry, that one of uh, financial crime. Um, as professionals in our respective fields, chances are we would have already crossed our paths, and if not yet, we'll most probably cross our paths with financial crime activity, which may go under the radar or undetected, right in front of us. Uh, sometimes it goes undetected without major involvement, uh, but there is a real risk that if we don't take the right measures, we may end up facilitating more laundering. So that's why I wanted us to uh, spend some time uh, uh, talking about risk-based uh, uh, risk based approach and how is it that in practice we can mitigate these financial crime trends that uh, Gavin has been uh, sharing with us and, and, and uh, similar ones in the future and existing ones. Uh, the good news is that even though we have new trends, the controls and the, and the safeguards that we can uh, put in place haven't changed that much, still, still argues, and, and we, are, uh, we can actually tailor them to be uh, as effective, if not, if not more effective, as um, uh, just by leveraging the, the information and intelligence that we have uh, obtained from the law enforcement agencies and the regulatory bodies. Um, over time, I have grown, and, and we will spend a couple of minutes on, on this slide, uh, and Andrea, uh, I, I'm conscious that it's a busy slide, but I wanted to share with you uh, a story first before we jump into the intricates of these bullet points here. Um, over time, I've grown a certain sixth sense, uh, you know, to sniff contexts and businesses that are attracted to attracted to financial crime activity, and let it be money laundering, tax evasion, bribery, and corruption fraud. I'm pretty sure that many of, of our colleagues here on the call would would, would um, have a, a similar uh, experience on, in their own fields and daily practices. And this is by by of course training by experience. It's basically what I do. Uh, but it was not like that. I mean, and, and I wanted to share with you perhaps a story from 15 years ago. I was in a different subject, completely different subject matter area. I was in, in management consulting, slightly similar, but definitely uh, focusing on integrating that. And there was an emerging uh, um, uh, project I was working in, two banks that had just agreed a transaction. And we had to take a look at the accounts and the customers of both banks. Um, and you know, basically uh, uh, plan and execute the integration, agree what's the best way to bring all the accounts, all the customers into, into a single bank. And, and there was a, a skyscraper uh, with a pretty nice view over the Pacific Ocean. Just, just think about it, you know, all sunny out there, uh, holding workshops you know, with some banking officials and who are reviewing the products and figuring out the best way and asking them the whistles and everything, how it works. And eventually we came to this collection of a bit more of exotic um, products that had thousands of, of accounts of that kind. And these were like ready-made accounts where the customer name was not, was not a name, it was actually a number what they had. So instead of a, of a name, they had a number. And uh, well, when I asked about the name of the account, I was told that they were in a separate spreadsheet. Yes, we have the name of the customers, but they're they in a separate spreadsheet outside of the main banking system in custody by someone. Um, and they asked us to basically plan to migrate those accounts uh, as they were. And uh, the information they said, uh, completing the customer files, you know, all the KYC or the know your customer files, customer diligence would be, would be migrated by, by them. We just need to migrate the account information and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end, it all sounded as if it was mainly grannies and grandpas that, you know, past retirement age that didn't want their details published to avoid unsolicited marketing. That was sort of a relatively safe, safe setting, let's say. And so we did, you know, we migrated, we migrated all the accounts and everyone was singing and dancing and mission was accomplished. So after that, fast forward 10 years and it's, uh, you know, year 
um, 2016, the Panama Papers scandal first appeared in the news. You might remember with the firm Mossack Fonseca and thousands of offshore entities. Many of those offshore entities used for legitimate purposes, but also many of them used as vehicles for money laundering, bribery and corruption and tax evasion as we would have read eventually or heard eventually in, in, in the news. So it turns out those accounts and exotic products that I had come across 15 years ago were part of the entities and the portfolio of Mossack Fonseca. And it went just under the radar, right in front of us. The data was actually just flowing through our fingertips. So in short, um, it's just, just was sharing with you an example. Um, uh, uh, we have to be on the front for financial crime activity, and particularly these trends that we have heard from Gavin after the pandemic may very well cross our path very soon, if it hasn't already. So now on to, on to the, uh, the topic. Now, due to COVID-19, we are, we're in a crisis. Uh, different countries and economies in, in better or worse position, not to mention, of, of course, the human side of, of, the, of the impact. Um, but one of the most successful industries during the pandem pandemic has been financial crime. And uh, as presented by Gavin, there has been an increasing activity and observed trends that are pertinent to you and to your, to your clients. We can all mitigate these emerging risks by following a risk-based uh, approach uh, underpinned by four key steps. Uh, we call it a risk-based approach because we prioritize the risk and focus our controls on the highest risks and apply simpler controls on the lower risk scenarios. So we say we take an approach proportional to the risk and, and the context of our business. Um, as a first step, we identify and assess the risk and this is uh, at the time of accepting a new client or entering into a new transaction. By assessing same certain risk factors, and we will mention a bit more about those, uh, about the clients, we can uh, do an assessment of what's the level of risk, what are the financial crime risks that uh, this relationship might entail, and therefore define the level of scrutiny and the controls that we need to put in place in the second step. Um, in assessing that risk, we would take a look at the countries uh, related to the client. We will, we will discuss that in a bit more detail, what that means uh, truly. The um, client risk associated with the industries in which the client operates, the legal entity types, whether that customer has any tax or sanctions uh, exposures. The services that we provide as a firm to them, how, how attractive is that service to facilitate uh, their money laundering or their financial crime activities, and ultimately, how do we manage our relationship with them? What are the channels we use? Do we rely on intermediaries or not? Uh, then on on the second step, once we have concluded uh, what the level of risk is, and we say, well, this is a risk that uh, a client that embodies a high, medium, or low risk, and uh, it has associated money laundering or fraud risks, then we decide on the second step what sort of controls we will put in place. So, um, uh, first of all, we would start by performing due diligence on the clients. So, learn who they are, what they do, what is the nature of their business, who are the, shelf, the shareholders, and we have to check whether they are politically exposed persons and the related parties as well. It may be the partners or the siblings or the children or, or uh, uh, some close uh, relationships of the shareholders, maybe perhaps themselves. We have to take a look as well whether they are subject to sanctions. As we know, uh, the US, EU, UK, United Nations, uh, to name some, some of the main sources, issue political and economic measures uh, where they prohibit dealing with individuals, companies, governments of countries, even shipping vessels can be sanctioned. And this is done as a means to exercise international pressure, as we know, um, uh, as an alternative to uh, military force or, or action. Um, and any company that breaks, including us as, as professionals, auditors or accountants, tax advisors, any one of us that breaks these sanctions and enters into a prohibited relationship, uh, we are subject to, of course, facing criminal and, and economic consequences. Um, we can com uh, complement the, the check with some fraud databases as well. So in the UK, for example, we have the ciphers. Uh, in the US, uh, you have private corporations like the um, uh, like Experian who provide fraud checks and 
uh, there may be other options in your local jurisdiction. We should have procedures in place as well on this second step to report suspicious activity. We will, we will um, uh, perhaps uh, comment in that in, in more detail. Uh, but in some jurisdictions, even if you're not regulated, uh, if you know or suspect that money laundering is taking place, you should report this. For example, in the UK, suspicious activity reports are reported to the NCA. In the US, suspicious transaction reports equivalent are reported to FinCEN. And I'm, I'm quite sure you would uh, probably have a similar uh, mechanism in your local um, uh, jurisdiction. But in general terms, being regulated or not, we should all have policies and procedures that clearly define what is it that we will do what is it that we will not do in terms of risk taking and how we will carry out these controls? Um, and a favorite one, the second step for me is training and culture. Uh, we need to take the mindset uh, uh, of our people to be on the ready, to know what is going on out there. Uh, these trends that Gavin was mentioning uh, is important for our, our employees or collaborators in the firm to be aware of those and uh, what they need to be uh, prepared for, how to operate, what are the policies of your firm and how to execute the procedures. Uh, and with regular, we also should perform a, um, a business risk assessment. So you need to take a step up and uh, uh, understand holistically what are the financial crime risks that your firm is exposed to. Perhaps you have a collection of clients that are uh, particularly active in wholesale of medical equipment or pharmaceutical goods, or uh, some of your clients may be particularly active in taking part into public procurement processes. So overall, you need to understand what sort of uh, 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 financial crime risks you are exposed to as a, as a firm. And that helps to, to tailor and to inform as well how you need to adjust your controls framework. Um, employee screening is another one there. Uh, it's important to screen our employees if uh, uh, we haven't already in terms of criminal records, credit checks even. And this helps to avoid convolution and internal fraud and some of the um, uh, scenarios or cases that uh, we have heard during Gavin's um, um, chapter and exposition. Um, and finally, we should have a regular as well, independent review of our controls. Um, if uh, we can test them, then we can, we can make sure it's going to eventually capture uh, uh, and mitigate the risks in the best possible way. Now, on number three, uh, ongoing monitoring, different to, to other sectors, so say in banking and insurance, of course, the, the level of transactionality is a lot, uh, it's very intense compared to what we do in our professional services firms. Uh, with they have millions of payments coming in and out, and and of course for them transaction monitoring and going monitor, monitoring has a, probably a, a more of a real time uh, significance in terms of what is it they need to do. But for us, however, in our professions, in our in our firms, we have access to reviewing financial accounts of companies. We 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 have access to understanding the transactions, the corporate structure, the suppliers, the customers, the products and services they they uh, produce. And, uh, and uh, eventually we produce or audit their account. So we can definitely resort to the natural uh, professional skepticism. And if necessary, we can flag suspicious activity or manifestation of financial crime trends as, as we have seen in the previous chapter. Uh, for example, we may notice that uh, one of our clients, maybe perhaps a large conglomerate of firms, uh, starts doing a whole set of restructuring operations and uh, that they were incorporating new companies and requesting for each subsidiary uh, business help scheme loans sponsored by the government, which, which might be then a sign of alert as, as we have seen. So that's just, uh, just an example. Um, and finally, on step four, uh, documentation. It's, it's key for us to document, to keep the records. We need to keep evidence of all the activities we do in steps one, two, and three. And we need to keep that for um, to be able to clearly demonstrate and articulate later, if required, to the authorities why we consider a certain client to be low, medium, or high risk, and why we took the measures or control we took, and how we executed those controls. What is it that we did? We need to keep a, a clear audit trail of all that. So, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, and. Let's take a closer look at how the financial crime trends uh, that Gavin mentioned are mitigated by these controls in using our, our risk-based approach. So what do you have on the, on the rows are the, let's say the um, typologies are the 
the common cases that uh, we would have seen in in um, in, um, in the trends uh, um, uh, highlighted by Gavin, and what we have on the columns uh, in the matrix, uh, as you would have noticed, are the the three key steps of our risk-based approach and the underlying subcontrols, if you will. The first seven cases that we have in the list, so from counterfeit medical goods and personal protection equipment fraud, all the way down to investment fraud, all of those can be mitigated to a great extent at the outset by assessing the risk of the clients. So step one, and performing due diligence in step two and during the ongoing monitoring when we prepare or review their accounts. So let's start with counterfeit of uh, uh, the counterfeit medical goods or personal protection recruitment fraud. Um, during the client risk assessment, we, could, we can detect high risk situations if we have a client operating in uh, specific sectors, so sectors that uh, are in the distribution or wholesale of medical material equipment, uh, pharmaceutical, or a client that has not been traditionally in those sectors and suddenly enters into this sector during the uh, period of the pandemic. Uh, if we have one of large transactions that are related to this sector, uh, it may require further, further review, maybe an early uh, sign for us to, to be alert. Um, the abuse of economic um, stimulus measures, uh, in the UK, uh, we have the Corporate Business Interruption Loan Schemes, so C bills and Bones Back Loan Schemes, BBLS, which is part of the uh, measures that uh, Gavin was, uh, sharing with, was sharing with us. Uh, and we have to alert for, be alert again for large corporations uh, that might be based in countries that uh, where the governments offer uh, relief programs in place and, and sudden restructurings or serial company formations and asking for such a relief, a relief might be might be a sign to be uh, to be uh, quite um, uh, wary about uh, misappropriation of government funds, misappropriation of aid. We have to be particularly alert uh, about companies uh, with PEPs in uh, in their uh, beneficiary owners, or companies that deal with counterparties who are PEPs. Uh, we have to be careful about charities or trusts that are receiving governmental uh, aids related to COVID-19, hospitals, clinics, or uh, anybody that is uh, sort of handling uh, procurement processes. Let it be on the uh, buyer side or the supply side, particularly in relation to medical equipment or pharmaceuticals or emergency purchases. Uh, in relation to charity fraud, uh, legal entity types, again, of charities or trusts or limited companies that uh, have been designated to be uh, not-for-profit, that have been recently uh, formed, that are receiving donations and having a mission to fight COVID-19 to allegedly fund research, for example. And, and if those entities have exposure to high-risk countries where uh, charitable work, let's say, is uh, more likely regulated, then that is another sign to be to be uh, alert about. And, um, and finally, on investment fraud, we have to be alert about companies in asset management, wealth management, financial services in general, who have been advertising investment in biotech, uh, vaccine research, drug research, uh, even startups raising capital via crowdfunding. Those, those would be, uh, I would say, the, um, the um, typical uh, elements that we might be able to capture early on, early on in our uh, first step or during the uh, initial ongoing due diligence. And the final two ones, uh, probably cyber crime and, and abuse of remote working conditions uh, are uh, better mitigated by four checks, training, and employee screening. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, and uh, perhaps we will uh, talk very briefly about this, I'm conscious of, uh, of time. Um, perhaps uh, we could jump to next, and I could uh, I could speak on the next one uh, to both slides. So, um, um, taking a closer look at step one, the identification and assessment of the risk. This step can be done manually, combined with a check of PEPs and sanctions. Many firms still do this manually, or you can use a more automated means. For example, at HLB, you have access to a client risk rating app that takes into consideration all the risk elements of countries, products or services, industries or sectors, um, channels uh, you use to interact with the client 
and uh, it also has integrated PEPs and sanction screening. The advantage of using an automated solution is that the assessment takes into consideration input from external recognized sources, is consistent, and reduces the space for getting it wrong, for overlooking risks. And it stays, stays up to date with, with uh, trends. Um, in the assessment, uh, you would uh, input in relation to your client the countries uh, that it is exposed to. So in the case of legal entities, that is the country of registration, the countries of operation, the countries, is, the countries where it provides um, services. And, uh, and also you would take into consideration the countries of the uh, key shareholders and ultimate beneficiary owners, their countries of nationality, their countries of domicile or residence. Um, and in terms of products or services, you would uh, highlight the services that you as a firm are providing to them. And that would also as well determine the exposure that the relationship is creating. Because if you are providing, say, company or transformation services, that actually your service could be very easily be uh, faci facilitate uh, money laundering activity by for example exploiting these uh, schemes uh, from the government to uh, to um, uh, bail uh, firms and, and, and corporations um, and then you would also indicate what are what's the legal entity type of your of your um, of your clients and um, what is a charity, a trust, a limited company, and so on and so forth. And particularly the industry sectors, uh, you would indicate and associated with the sector as well. Then comes the the different levels of exposure. Now, if we can move on to the uh, next slide. So. Once you know uh, the rating of your client, whether it's high, medium, or low, also you should follow uh, uh, the steps to perform due diligence. And if it is a high-risk uh, scenario, a high-risk client, you should perform enhanced due diligence. And that may entail, among other things, that you will be uh, reviewing, for example, identifying and reviewing uh, the uh, shareholders that have 10% uh, or more uh, of uh, shares in the company, whereas in you know, medium or low risk cases, you will assess uh, uh, from 25% or above of, uh, of share. But you need to have a clear client due diligence procedure. Uh, in the case of the client risk rating app that you have at HLB, uh, it already recommends the requirements that you need to follow depending on the client risk rating. So uh, it's, uh, it's worth uh, bearing that in mind. So um, conscious of time, I'll, I'll leave it up to this uh, point. I believe that uh, uh, it would be best probably to open the floor for uh, for any questions, Andrea. So uh, I'll hand over actually back to you, Gavin, in case so you would like to share some final thoughts uh, with uh, with our audience in terms of what to do if anything of this, uh, despite the controls, uh, materializes. Sure. Thank you, uh, Pedro. Um, I just want to briefly uh, run through when it all goes wrong. Don't panic. In order not to panic, have a strategy in place in advance of <laughs> a few essentials of how you should deal with um, a fraud event that arises in your firm, in your client, in a company that's trading. Um, you, you need to uh, have time to think in advance about what you're going to do when it all goes wrong. And that is the, the key is to have a thought um, plan which deals with basic questions so, so who, do you, who do you need to tell what do you do do you need to get lawyers involved do you need to get external investors investigators involved do you sack the person if it's uh, someone who works for you um, there are answers to those questions um, I suggest you don't immediately sack someone that you uh, make sure that they don't have access to the company systems anymore. Um, do you keep it all in house? Do you go external? Um, it's on a needs basis, so it will be self evident, perhaps as a consequence of the severity of the fraud event, whether you need to get, for example, lawyers involved or external parties involved. Um, investigation will, at heart, I'm a financial investigator and um, I have professional skills to do that. There are things that anyone can do. Um, which is to get hold of and preserve the evidence and um, make sure that nothing is lost. Um, and also then think about whether you get the police involved. 
But at the end of the day, as Pedro um, was saying, I certainly believe uh, avoidance is better than cure if you can um, not become party to a fraud or a, a, a victim of a fraud in the first place, and it has to be better. Be vigilant, um, be skeptical, and don't believe everything you read or see. Uh, think twice before transferring money, money going awry in transit for bank transfers is one of the most common forms of fraud at the moment. Do your research and your due diligence in advance, as Pedro was saying. Um, don't disclose personal confidential information unless you're absolutely sure you're uh, delivering it to the right person and that it is necessary. But finally, if you've been the victim of fraud, do you report it or not? Um, whether that will help or not, whether you need to, will be very much subject to the individual circumstances and indeed the, the country requirements of, of where you're based. Um, but be careful, be vigilant. If something's too good to be true, then it often is. Over to you, Andrea. Brilliant. Thank you both very much. Um, conscious of time. So um, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop us an email um, via the HLB website um, and we will get those answered um, through either Gavin and Pedro and sent back to you. Um, but just for any more insights, do visit our website for further updates. Um, and it's just on to me to thank Gavin and Pedro for their, for their time and for their insights. Um, and thank you all very much for joining. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.